My name is Carol Folt, and I'm the Chancellor at UNC Chapel Hill. It's great to be here. It has been a fantastic uh, morning. Certainly, I've been taking more notes about ways that <laughs> I could go back and do things completely in a new way with, with so much great input, and I, I think many people are feeling the same way. Uh, my role in this session is really to introduce our speaker, because he is our session today, and I think it's quite fitting, because he really, I think in many ways, uh, is, is the quintessential example of someone who has been spending his time working in areas of convergence. So it's my, uh, my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, which is Dr. Arun Majumdar. He's currently the Vice President of Energy for Google, where he's in charge of the company's energy initiative. Now, I think we know that that, is, that whole area and field of energy and sustainability is really one of the areas that we all know has really been taking leadership at looking in areas of convergence and building new types of partnerships. Before joining Google, Dr. Majumdar served as the founding director of the Advanced Research Projects Agency, Energy, called ARPA-E, as well as the Acting Undersecretary of Energy in the Department of Energy. Under his leadership, ARPA-E focused, again, I think very apropos for this uh, meeting, on high-risk research, how you get that, support that, and have it be very productive, looking for research that could radically change the way energy was produced, stored, and distributed. During his tenure, the agency funded over 275 projects, some of which have now led to successful startup companies. He helped create a vision at ARPA-E that would innovate the future of energy technologies, establishing productive partnerships uh, between the agency, the Department of Defense, as well as with multiple private sector organizations. He also worked to convince the many stakeholders, including Congress, the benefits and values of innovation in the area of energy and how to make that competitive and indeed how that could help sustain the competitiveness of the nation. So I think he's going to have a lot to share with us on uh, these particular areas and he will also be drawing on his long career in research in science and engineering, nanoscale materials and devices. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Majumdar. Thank you very much for the really generous introduction. Um, you know, when I was invited for this, I wasn't quite sure whether this would uh, be appropriate or not, but then Susan Hockfield called me, and you know, when, if, if she has tried to persuade you, you know how it is. You cannot say no. But, uh, and so she persuaded me to come and speak uh, and share some of my experiences with Alpha E. But let me also take this opportunity to thank you, Susan, for your and MIT's team in engaging in energy and innovation, and that was extremely important um, for ARPA-E, because when we had the opportunity and the challenge to start from scratch and start a federal agency from scratch, and, you know, I would, have, I would like to say we had a whole plan for doing so. We did not. And we adapted, and I think one of the things that we, we were learning uh, on, on the job and we were adapting but fortunately, um, or <laughs> I had been funded by many of the agencies in Washington, D.C., and fortunately I'd been rejected by many of the agencies for ideas that are not so great, which was appropriate. And so we had learned, uh, at least myself and my team members, uh, knew quite a bit about how the federal agencies were running, and we took best practices um, from many of the agencies put together. We copied. So I'm going to share with you a few of those, um, of those experiences. So um, just a little bit of history. There's a lot of history of RPE and the National Academy because the idea of RPE originated out here in the National Academy through Rising of the Gathering Storm report, Norm Augustine leading it. And then this led to the America Competes Act, where RPE was authorized, among many other things. And then in 2009, January, Steve Chu became the Secretary of Energy, and fortunately for uh, all of us, he was also part of the Gathering Storm Committee, where he did not wear a tie at that time. And in Washington, he had to wear a tie, and he was fighting at that time. Um, 
But it was very important to his presence out there, and I'll come to that later on, was very critical because he was amongst the Gaddingstrom, and I know some of you, Cherry was part of that committee. Uh, there were many supporters of RPE, um, and it was important for one of them to be there as, as the lead uh, because with anything new in Washington, you know, they're Washington is they're, they're builders and they're blockers. So we need someone to do blocking and tackling. And that was the Secretary of Energy. And um, of course, RPE was launched in April with not a single employee in RPE. But the president launched it, then something had to be done. And I showed up in October. And uh, by that time, I was really blessed with a small group of people, and we built upon that. So just a little bit of history. Um, what's the goal of RPE? The mission of RPE, it's written in the, in, in the law, is to translate science into uh, quantum leaps in energy technology that are too risky for the private sector to initiate, not to engage, but initiate. But if successful, they would create the foundation for entirely new industries. Now, this is great. It's all writing. But it's very important, at least I felt, that when you're starting something new, you have to have an example of something concrete. And it's always good to go back in history and see what's the concrete example that you can point to. And I said, this was a game changer. This was a quantum leap in where science and engineering came together and changed things. And so I just want to give you one brief example of that historical context. And I'll, many of you know this example. And this is a, we call it the historical high bar. Okay? This raises the bar of what, you, what the people in RP had to do. Now, this was no pressure on them. And this goes back to 1898, when there was a calling upon science by Sir William Crookes, who was a physicist, uh, calling upon science to save the world from impending starvation. And this is, at that time, it was felt that there was, that there was going to be an impending famine. There was not enough nutrition in the soil. And there was all kinds of things that were going on, like going to the Guano Islands in, in the Pacific, South America, to get these nitrates out there. And that got over. And then Chile and Salt, uh, Salt Peter was there. And the United States Congress was very functional. It came up with the Guano Island Act of 1856, which meant that any American who occupies the Pacific Island becomes, becomes America, which is why we own so many islands, by the way, and which was very useful not for Guano, but, <laughs> but during the Second World War. And of course, that led scientists and engineers to think about what to do. And of course, uh, Fritz Haber uh, discovered the catalyst that would combine atmospheric nitrogen, which is extremely hard to break because we've got a triple bond out there, to form ammonia. And the catalyst, first catalyst is uranium. Uh, this is before nuclear. And of course, Bosch uh, developed the process to mass produce ammonia and made fertilizers. And it is beautifully uh, you know, described in this book called Alchemy of Air, which became the, the reading material for RPE. Anyone who would join RPE should read this because that's how, that was the high bar. And of course, uh, most of the nitrogen that we have in our bodies you know, a, a good fraction of it comes from the Haber-Bosch process. So that was a high bar of how science and engineering looked at a societal problem, and science and engineering could address that and solve it and change the game. So that was what people in RP were supposed to do. So I'm going to give you uh, two examples of where convergence perhaps may have been there. And let me give you uh, two. And one is on the biological side, and the other is the physical side. And this, so one idea that we had was, let's look at sunlight to fuel. A lot of ways were being pursued uh, from, from using sunlight to make uh, renewable fuels. Uh, most of them are photosynthetic. And as many of you know, uh, photosynthesis, you know, you can use it in algae or biomass or corn, etc. But the, the process of photosynthesis uses a cycle called the Calvin-Benson cycle. And the Calvin-Benson cycle is very inefficient. It's less than 1% efficiency going from sunlight to fuel chemical bond, carbon-carbon bond. And, you know, nevertheless, this was what was in hand. A lot of people, a lot of, a lot of centers were pursuing it. And we, we sort of asked the question, what is biology really doing out here? The carbon-benson cycle is making the carbon-carbon bond, and it, it's very hard to beat biology in making specific carbon-carbon bonds. So it said, is there, is there any other approach? Well, there's a non-photosynthetic approach, which, has, which is being tried, still being tried, using chemical catalysis, 
to form syngas, to form methanol. It's very hard to make carbon-carbon bonds, but Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis, which is a DOE center, is now pursuing it, and that's going on. And, you know, presumably you could go up to 90%, but let's say it's greater than 1%. If you can get to 3 or 4%, it's a big deal. So this was being uh, done. But this was not biology, or maybe some elements of biology was being used, and the question is, can you be specific? Again, you can form methanol, but to form ethanol is not easy. So what we tried, and I'll tell you how it came about, is a different approach of using biology catalysis, which became, we coined the word electrofuels. And it really was a brainchild of one of our team members, and that's Eric Toon. And I'll come to the people aspect, you know, one of the lessons learned out here. The idea is very simple. You take, uh, in a reducing equivalence, whether it's electrons or hydrogen sulfide or hydrogen, ammonia, or oxidizing ions like plus two to plus three of uh, iron, then you have cycles to fix the carbon dioxide, and you need not use Calvin-Benson cycle. There's reverse tricarboxylic cycle with lung dial cycle, which are much more efficient than Calvin-Benson cycle to make carbon-carbon bonds. And then you do metabolic engineering to produce acetyl-CoA, and then you can go to essentially any fuel you want or byproduct you want. Now, this came about. So how did this idea come about? And this came about out of a workshop. And everyone in RPE was supposed to do a workshop if you create a program. And Eric had this vision, or at least had the hunch, that perhaps there's something out there. And in synthetic, at the intersection of synthetic biology, people looking at extremophiles and people looking at molecules that would do light harvesting. And it was not clear what it was. And you got the community together. And I said, hey, we are, our idea is to increase the photon efficiency and to generate liquid fuels. Can you do it? And that you know, uh, led to many discussions in this two-day workshop that actually led to this idea of using electrofuels. And at that time, when it was started, you know, the organisms that we're looking at, people did not know how to do genetic manipulation. People knew the genome, but genetic manipulation was not quite clear. And finally, they figured out while in the program there was a lot of risk. A lot of people said that this is not going to work. But they figured out, and within a year and a half or so, this is the first electrofuel. It's a biofuel without the use of sunlight made by OPX Biotechnology and a group at NC State, and they got this you know, uh, biofuel together um, out of this process. So this is an example of, I suppose, a convergence of various fields, and we found that at that time, people looking at extremophiles were not talking to the people looking at synthetic biology, uh, talking about you know, researching in synthetic biology, et cetera. Let me give you another example. This is the electricity grid. And the, the NAE has said that this is the greatest engineering achievement of the 20th century, and it, it is indeed so. And if you go back in the history, this is how it started. It started with Tesla and Edison, going back to 1890s and early 1900s. The architecture is 100 years old. Okay, this architecture is centralized generation. You've got a transmission system, and you've got a distribution system. That architecture has not changed for about 100 years or so. And here's where uh, we have a problem. We have trillion dollars of assets on our grid today. And just to give you one example, the average age of these transformers, this is a distribution substation transformer going from a few hundred volts to you know, you know, tens of volts, uh, kilovolts, sorry, a few hundred kilovolts to tens of kilovolts. The average age is 42 years. The expected life is 40 years. So we are on borrowed time right now. And the backlog for these, uh, <laughs> these transformers is several months. And that's where we are on the grid. So we asked the question, these, many of these transformers are going to be replaced. Are you going to take the same transformer and, and just replace it, or is there an opportunity to innovate? So it's very problem-focused. And so here is Rajiv Ram, who is electrical engineering CS department at MIT. He's not even in power engineering. He had to spread his wings and get into power. It was his decision that I'm going to look at this and see what you could do. So today's transformers, you, you see this big tank out there? That's the cooling oil. Okay, for, for, for cooling the transformer. And this run at, you know, 60 hertz, a megawatt of transformer, roughly megawatt, is about 8,000 pounds. You need a crane to install it. We don't even make them in the United States. And most of the cost, this is expensive, most of the cost is in the magnets, not in the you know, wiring. It's, in the, it's the hunk of iron that is used in the magnets. That's the state of the art. And we said maybe we could do something about it. And the idea was to, can you get to megawatt in about 100 pounds low cost, 100 to 1,000 times reduction in the magnet size, which will reduce the cost, 
and can you enable network communication and computation? Because that would really make the grid much more intelligent that we have. And the idea was to go up in frequency. Because 60 hertz is, you know, you can operate the grid at 60 hertz. There's no reason why you need to do power conversion at 60 hertz. If you go up in frequency, the magnet, the frequency goes up, the magnet size, the inductor goes down, capacitor size goes down, you need new circuits, et cetera. So here's where, when we got the, the, the workshop together, Rajiv really initiated it, wide band gap semiconductors coming on board. This is a single transistor from Cree of silicon carbide that can handle 15 kilovolts drop in a single transistor across 200 microns and, and running 100 amps. So 1.5 megawatts on a single transistor, and this is modulating a chopping at 50 kilohertz, which is absolutely amazing technology. And you can imagine the materials issues that are involved in that. But that is just one aspect of it. We didn't need magnets. We need high frequency, low loss, nanostructure. The nanostructure is important out here, soft magnets. And most of the research invest in, investment in magnetism was in hard magnets because of data storage. No one had invested in soft magnets. And then, of course, capacitors, et cetera. So how did this come about? It came about from a workshop where Rajiv had the initiative and had the hunch that you have, you know, you need, you got wide band gas semiconductor and people, DART had invested in that for power, you know, for RF power, but not for DC power, DC to DC, AC to DC, et cetera. You had soft magnets, most of the investment was in hard magnets, but not in soft magnets, then circuits and systems as well as capacitors. And this was a workshop that he got together, and we realized the people who do magnetism or soft magnets don't talk to the white bad guys sitting doctor guys. And, and they don't, certainly don't talk to the capacitor guys. And circuits, yes, a little bit out here, but not much. And so that was the, the people were not talking to each other, so it needed someone like Rajiv to catalyze something out here. And soon enough, there's a startup company called Transform, which is gallium nitride-based, you know, three-phase, two-kilowatt inverter, which is size of like this. It just shrinks. Everything shrinks. This is, this is a great example. Here's an LED drive, driver of today, going from AC to DC, 25 watt. This is what they're building. It, it, it'll fit at the, the tip of your nail, the, the, the actual you know, the LED driver, if you go to 5 megahertz or 10 megahertz frequency. So that's the innovation. So I'm going to use examples as to draw some lessons. And as I said, these lessons, did not, we were not absolutely aware of what we were doing, but these were lessons that we took later on and we sort of worked our way through this. This was, this was not a grand plan that we had, in all humility. But before we do that, it's very important to see what did we actually do? I mean, why is, why, what were we trying to do? In the energy space, cost and scale is everything. If, it, if something does not go down in cost and does not scale up, it doesn't matter. So when you look at cost and, and, and size and scale, I mean, you, you are in the world of economics now. And in, in economics, there's something called a learning curve or an experience curve. Anything, you build an air conditioner, lithium-ion battery, or even transistors, you go through learning. The more you do, the better you become, the cheaper it becomes because you increase your yield in manufacturing, et cetera. So every technology goes through a learning curve. And in this learning curve, you've got technology innovation, you've got manufacturing scaling, you've got deployment, you've got business issues out here. And the DOE, and this is where we have to differentiate with other parts of DOE, the R&D from the DOE Applied Energy Programs. We're looking at existing learning curves and making incremental improvements by using science. And incremental improvements are extremely important for, a, for an insurance policy because something is working, you want to make it better and better and better. Our base goal was not to do this, but to do this, to create entirely new learning curves where you have breakthrough technologies which have the chance in the future to become cheaper and better than existing technologies today. So that was the idea, and by, by its very definition, it is risky. And these crosses are where some of these ideas would fail. And these are not fail, failures, but opportunities to learn and go back. But you have a portfolio of approaches, you don't know which one's gonna win, and, but you let them go, and let them compete. And, and so now you create this learning curve, and somewhere in the future it will be cheaper and better. But the nation as a whole has the benefit of both the incremental and the disruptive together. So, you, so we could perhaps transition to a better technology somewhere in the future, and would rather have that come from within the United States from outside. That was the whole idea. So given all this, what are the lessons learned? And I'm going to touch upon three things. People, 
institutional values and external processes. Again, we, on hindsight, this is what we can say. But we had a few ideas, but we adapted as we went along. The people. Um, the examples that I gave you of Rajiv, Ram, and Eric Toon, those are just two examples. There were many others. But we wanted active researchers who, were, who had demonstrated some originality and expertise in at least one field. That was necessary, but not sufficient. The second part was we wanted people who went out of their comfort zone and went and entrepreneurial to quickly learn about a new field, map out the scientific and technical landscape, and sniff out the most important problems. So the, the, the thing is not out here, it's in the nose. To sniff out the most important problem to find out. Finally, we also wanted people to span and bridge science and engineering systems with the experience in spinning out a company and or deliver a product to market. So many of these people started something or licensed their technology somewhere, was involved in some way to have impact on the market side. And thought leadership, that is demonstrated leadership to communicate a vision and bring together different communities to catalyze something new. And these were the characteristics. Now, when I say that, you know, this was, you could, on hindsight, we found that this was the right mix of people because we made some mistakes in recruiting. And people, we found later on that they didn't quite fit some of these attributes, and frankly, they didn't survive in RPE. They had to leave. And that was one of the lessons learned. It's one of the attributes that are really critical to make this thing work. So this is and a part of the, the people attributes, institutional values. There was some internal operation and culture, very important, highly selective in recruiting. I mean, our, my biggest challenge in RP in Washington was not to deal with Congress. Actually, that turned out to be not so difficult, believe it or not. But to recruit talent, the right kind of people who would enable, who had the right attributes to enable this. And by the way, people talk about salary, et cetera. This was not to make money. Government doesn't pay you very well. But this, so people did not have the idea of public service, they should not be here. And so that was one of the things that we had to sort of filter out. The other part, we had to, I mean, this was part of a culture. We learned this from DARPA and many other places. Empower the program directors to spread their wings and identify white spaces. Make the, let them make the decisions of what they want to create, what they want to fund, et cetera, but have them accountable, but maintain very high expectations of creativity and thought leadership. They had to do their own research and be the thought leader of, of that field that they wanted to create. Extremely high clarity in mission not just for the technical people, but for the lawyers, but the budget officers, everyone in RPE had to have the same sense of mission and purpose. Otherwise, things don't work out. And because if you do that, then the interaction, the social interactions within RPE, within an organization, really helps. Because you do need the lawyers, you do need the budget officers, you do need the other people to help out and have the same sense of speed and integrity together. The rigorous vetting process for establish a new research program with open constructive de debate. And let me just explain this a little bit. If someone was trying to create a program in biofuels, everyone had an opportunity to comment, even the guys who were looking at power electronics and air conditioners. Because it was not just an opportunity to have a comment, but to also learn about what's going on in other fields and perhaps see some connections between what's going on over there and in their own field. So this was, a, this was you know, each meeting was like three or four hours of debate going on, and everyone had to speak. And of course, everyone had opinions. They were very opinionated people. But so collective team input, but of course, you have to have a single decision point, otherwise things don't get done. And of course, flat and transparent organization, focus on speed, integrity, financial discipline. When I say transparent, literally, if you go to the office of RPE in LaFont Plaza, all the, the walls are made of glass, literally transparent. So there's no privacy out here. It's one big community. And I, sometime if you get a chance, I hope you go and see that. Because that was part of the social side of it as well. In terms of research management culture, um, let me say a little bit about the review process. And having been through several federal agencies, um, both on the panels and getting reviewed, we said that maybe we could take the best practices uh, of many agencies and combine them. And one of the things that we introduced was this idea of a rebuttal phase. Because having been on several panels, and, and I'm, I suspect many of you share this experience, when you get into a panel, there's usually one or two people who dominate the discussion on a particular proposal. And they may be right or they may be wrong about something. They claim something that 
this is this is a bad idea because this does not does not work. Well, it's two or three people's opinion, and your whole career may depend on that. So what we said is, okay, the review comes in, and that's a recommendation from a in a review panel. We take the review panels and send it back to the PIs of the proposals, and I said, you got four days and four pages for rebuttal, because just like we do in our research papers. Just like we do in our patents, why can't we do the proposal? And we had to fight our lawyers to get it done. But it got done. And then from that, you look at the, the, the reviews and you got the rebuttal, and then the program director can make a decision with some discussion with me. And that brought some parity in the process, which can be completely asymmetric and can lead to really bad decisions and good ideas not working out. Then the idea of seedling projects, yes, seedlings are very important because sometimes they may have a great idea and they may not have a single data point and here is $200,000, $300,000, go check it out, go do an experiment and tell us. And if you are, if it's working out, then we can give you more money and come back and write a proposal again or we can expedite the process. Active program, these program directors, since they're active researchers, we wanted them to be part of the team itself but not micromanaged. But if they're stuck, bring that problem, either solve it or bring it back to RPE. All of us are here. We can get the benefit of all the discussions that are going on in RPE and, let, and help the team out. That was the idea. Problem focused uh, and outcome oriented. If a technology, we ask the question, if a technology succeeds, will it matter in the real world? So it was very focused on whether this would be, you know, whether it would matter or not. And if, is it a quantum leap? and the basis for an entirely new industry. If it is not, if it's incremental, that's not our job. So what is RPE projects and what is not is, is, was very important to us. And we never talked about disciplinary boundaries, you know, whether this is mechanical engineering or this is physics or this is chemistry. It was problem focused. And so let's solve the problem and let's see what it takes, what disciplines it takes to actually solve the problem. And we blur the boundaries, create feed, feedback loops between science and engineering. We wanted, if it's a problem, had science and systems, put scientists and engineers together and let them figure it out. Because if you don't have one aspect, you're only going to do science and not the engineering and vice versa. And, um, and the research program were created by the program directors. They created the program, it was bottom up, and, and there was sunset when they left RP. There was finite lifetime of program directors in RP. The story process very quickly through this is very diff important in Washington that I found to define yourself before others define you. Because there are a lot of people out here who want to define what RPE was and define you. And we had to do this, um, you know, and we learned it on the job itself. It was very important to have the partnership with the secretary, and I was very fortunate that Steve Chu was the Secretary of Energy, and he was the person from the Gathering Storm Committee who, you know, uh, who represented the committee for all the hearings in 2006, et cetera. And of course, it was very important to get the White House behind it as well. Autonomy, but not isolation. We needed autonomy. And in fact, uh, it was accidentally, we found ourselves outside Forrestal Building. And thank God we were outside Forrestal Building. Because if you were in that culture, it would have been, could have been a different ball game. So we were outside. And that was the isolation. It was, it was autonomous, but not isolation. We still had to be close enough. There was a question of whether we could move across the river and we said, no, that's too far away from, you know, mothership out here. Um, close partnership within, within the DOE. We had to get the other parts of DOE to really help us. And we could help them because they could have, you know, easily killed us. So uh, that was important. And very close partnership with industry and the investment in business communities. Um, we also recruited some thought and business leaders to have a stake in RPE's success. And that was important. People like Bill Gates, uh, Norm Augustine, uh, Chad Holliday, um, you know, Fred Smith, they were all involved. George White said they were all uh, part of the RPA Brain Trust. And because we needed their insight as to how to you know, create this organization. And finally, partnership with Congress. And I, I truly think that this is important. This, it is a partnership. It is not just a, you know, it, they have to have a stake in this as well. So we also wanted to make it the most intellectually, socially enriching and stimulated, ex stimulating experience for, of the people who were involved. And I think I, you know, I was listening to, uh, to Fold Sharp about you know, what the cultural, the, societal is the cultural issues were. And let me just give you one slide on that. There was a lot of history that in the West Coast you miss out. And so we got interested in history. This 
Artifari Happy Hour. And this is Dorothy Robine, who was that time in DOD. And she used to come from many of the And the people, the Washington sort of assembled in our happy hour. So there was beer flowing fairly freely. Um, and this is RPE at Nats game. And this is, this is what our, our, our watering hole out here called the Ugly Mug. And that's, that's where we all got together on Thursday evenings and, you know, we solved the world's problem. But a lot of new programs came out of the discussions over there. So this is important. I think the social side of it is important. Very quickly on Google experience, um, uh, what we are trying to do out here in Google. So this is the electricity infrastructure in the, in the lights, and the red is where the people are, the population. And what you find immediately is that population and, and electricity use do not correlate. And we have had the benefit, starting in the United States, of the Tesla Edison 100-year-old architecture out here, and there are 3 billion people who have either no or very limited access to electricity. And by 2100, additional 3 billion people will be added to the same regions that do not have access or very marginal access to electricity. And there's going to be a massive level of urbanization that will occur in developing countries. The question we're asking is that should we string along the Tesla Edison grid or could we start from a clean sheet? And why, is, why do we want to start in a clean sheet? It's because there are things that have happened over the 100 years that Tesla and Edison did not have the benefit of. For example, the photovoltaic electricity could perhaps be cheaper than the grid and everywhere in the world in the next 10 years or so. Storage is going to get cheap. I talked about power electronics being available and telecom and mobile penetration being almost widespread across the world. Now, Tesla and Edison had nothing of this. On top of that, if you put the Google core competence, network distributed secure computing, and the question we're asking is, what would you do? And that's the convergence of various, the techno-economic convergence that we're now addressing. And I can't tell you what we're doing, but uh, this is what, we are, that, what we're trying to, you know, trying to explore right now. So let me thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer your questions.